Good morning. Welcome to Forums That Matter, a community service of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. I'm Jonathan Glaser, a member of the Forum Committee, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, which has both remote and in-person audiences. Today's topic re regards healthcare financing. For those of you who have been following the news, and since I've been living in Cleveland, there have been more than 10 closures of hospitals within Cuyahoga County alone, and this has involved every major healthcare system. <clears throat> um, the role of inflation and labor problems uh, has dominated the news. Uh, for my introduction, please use, um, uh, please follow. Uh, Donna Graham, we are pleased to have today. She has had almost 40 years as a leader in healthcare management and strategic planning, clinical operations, finances, and consumerism. She couples that with a technical background, including intellectual automation. Donna is recognized by national healthcare organizations and participates in advisory boards and is a catalyst for change. Donna has been with Metro Health for over 10 years. She is vice president of Revenue Cycle as you are well aware, Metro Health is the only public system in the state of Ohio. And in a brief uh, summary of her job description, she says her job is to get money from a turnip and make patients still grateful for it. Uh, Donna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Glass. Just give me one moment to bring this up. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today and talking with Dr. Glassar. I know that this is really uh, something near and dear to my heart. And the comment about taking money out of turnups is it's not basically out of the patient's pocket, it's out of the payer pocket. So I do a lot of lobbying with Medicare, Medicaid, and our commercial payers so that we can get more coverage for our patients, get more financial assistance for our patients, and take the barriers away from having health care both preventative and concurrent so that you don't have to worry about that. You need to just be taking care of yourself and your families for health care. So thank you very much. Today I'm going to basically talk about what the federal policies are, the state and local policies, pand pandemic, past, future, and current and also the healthcare management journey as to where we need to make changes to make sure that we're representing our community and patients, which brings in consumerism, and then also workforce management. Many of you are either know personally or familiar with uh, CMS.gov, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and basically their strategic plan is to be a trusted partner and steward with us, and they want to advance with healthcare equity, expanding coverage, and improving healthcare outcomes. That sounds very simplistic as to what they want to do, but to accomplish it is extremely challenging. From a current state with the US hospitals finances, and all of this information is public information. I'm not here today representing Metro itself. I'm taking you through the journey of what's been happening to us over the past five years. Um, the margins remain depressed relative to the pre-pandemic levels. March 2019 was a horrendous tragedy with the pandemic. And since that time, we have actually in hospitals over the country, on average, have reduced margins by about 37%. Um, federal support has helped us during COVID, known as HRSA, throughout 2022, but we're at a major risk of all the funding ending around December 6th of this year. Um, with the rapid inflation ranging from 5 to 8% increase in cost of caring, we've had severe workforce shortages, and we have to figure out how can we be innovative about them? We cannot keep creating people. Many people wanted life balance, many people retired. We have employees at Metro that have been here 44 years, 35 years, 30 years, 38 years. And during the pandemic, many of them decided it was time to retire and they're valued and very experienced for us. 1.9 trillion COVID provider relief package passed in March of 2021 and was to end in 2022. So you can imagine if $1.9 trillion is not funding us, what's going to happen to our hospitals? Another thing is that there's been 4% cuts from Medicare 
And also we have many um, short-term budgets in place. Sequestering is Medicare. Basically, they reduce the, the um, deductions for their processing, if you will, um, to only be 1%. That's moving up to 2%. They have all kind of bundling with testing vaccine and research where patients hadn't had to pay anything. And hospitals were being given the medications free of charge. They're looking at that going away. Physician rates are being cut. They're working harder. They're working faster. We use the term productivity, but in reference, they're taking care of patients. That word productivity sounds very harsh. The reimbursement is de declining. More volume, less reimbursement. And then the macro budget um, bonuses are basically, whoops, our quality, sorry. Had a finger funch there. <laughs> It's very, I, this is a computer I just got last night, so I apologize. Um, so the reality is with all of this going on, we're gonna face billions of dollars of losses in 2022 and continue on in 2023 under both optimistic and pessimistic models. Now I am an optimist. I'm gonna give you some news that is difficult, but I'm also gonna give you some rationale as to why we've survived over the past several years and why we will continue to survive. It's going to be your opinions and your objectivity as to whether or not you think different kinds of strategies are positive. But reality is there's a lot going into all of this. From a federal policy, um, and that's basically Medicare, we are really looking at what we're going to be able to do with COVID because it's not going away. It could become COVID-19, COVID-20, different strains. We have flus, things of that nature. We have to figure out what to do in the future, and we've been trying to do so that with this pandemic or any other pandemic, we can survive. Um, I mentioned to you about the provider relief fraud, that 1.9 million could be cut out, and um, we're going to continue to cut. Behavioral health has been one of the largest emphasis during this entire pandemic. Even though there's been concentration with Medicare and Medicaid over five years ago, the mental health disturbance is throughout the country. People have not socialized for multiple years. We've socialized with masks. The only thing people saw were our eyes. Children have never seen other children. They've never been in daycare, et cetera, until just most recently. And there's still been the scare about people, children may still have to work, um, go to school from home. Employers are not bringing back people to work anymore. Remote is the way that we're doing this. Um, at the Senate level, they're talking about increasing the specialties that can serve behavioral health. So social workers can start to do billing. Social workers can start to see behavioral health patients. Residency, pro residency programs are developing now so that we can get more behavioral health providers because there's a shortage. From the House perspective of the federal government, they're concentrating on more coverage, family coverage versus a person coverage for behavioral health and more outreach programs going into the community. Another thing that you may or may not be involved in is 340B. Hospitals such as Metro is a safety net hospital, essential hospital, government hospital. If you have so much of charity care that you're an uninsured and indigent patients, the hospitals get a reduction on expenses for medical. By them getting a reduction, they can pass it on to the patient. Remember, we talked about the turnip before. This is one of those turnips. We need to push the federal government co to continue with a program that they've threatened to cancel for the last four years. And then basically, um, the Congressional Budget Office is talking about capping doctors on how much time they're going to get paid. You can spend an hour with the patient, but we're only going to pay you for 20 minutes. So all of those things are taking place. And then surprise billing, and some of you might have read it in the newspapers, basically for the uninsured, you have to send every single uninsured patient an estimate three days after they make an appointment. Their appointment could be nine months from now. With the uninsured, we're scaring them because of the fact that they think that they're gonna be eligible for Medicaid or a state charity program or even a hospital charity program. And what's happening is they think they're getting billed for what is estimated. And they say, but I should be qualified for Medicaid. This is what happened to me. We said, we do understand, but we have to go through this process. So you can imagine getting a $16,000, $150,000, dollar bill in the mail. All we're doing is spending money on sending out letters and making phone calls and, and having the patients have anxiety. A lot of these rules don't make sense. Kind of hard to handle, isn't it? We're not making it easier, we're making it more difficult for everybody. 
We then go to the state level, which most of us are very familiar with, and that's pretty much the Medicaid programs. Um, the CHIP program is basically for children. And the good thing is, is that we're actually going to be able to cover more lives of the children by raising the poverty levels, because that's everything that's used to determine what the coverage is and what people's needs are. Although you can look at someone and know if they need shelter, they need food, they need assistance. But we do it by numbers as, as the government typically does. We're talking about it just in Ohio to add 300,000 more children to be able to be Medicaid eligible under the CHIPS program. Again, a lot more expenses. Hopefully the government will come through with that. Um, we're looking at trying to increase the reimbursement because it's decreased over the years. We're looking at um, how we're going to forecast actual versus um, what's going to happen in the future with COVID-19. We keep having ebbs and flows and we just don't know. And this mask I carry all the time because I can be in situations where I just don't know. It's not to be offensive. It's because we each have to take care of our own and I don't want to be um, with someone who feels it's important to have a mask and not be respectful of that. Um, my care is a combination of Medicare and Medicaid. So automatically a patient can be on Medicaid and any of their out of pocket, like outpatient, their 20% out of pocket can be covered. And you know that you don't need to worry about that because you will have no out of pocket expense. And then Ohio Medicaid is changing the entire program on top of everything else which is the Next Generation Managed Care Program. In 2022, Medicaid is saying they're going to save $186 million by becoming more efficient in the administration. And in 2023, they're gonna save $231 million. That's great to say that they're going to save it, but how are they going to save it? Are they going to save it by covering less people, less adults? Um, 2014, 19 year old males who were healthy could qualify for Medicaid. Pregnant women in their first trimester could qualify for Medicaid. Now what Medicaid is talking about is who really could still continue to work and possibly those people should not be qualifying for Medicaid. If you think about the unemployment and the stimulus that took place over the past three, four years, Everybody was very excited, right? They were unemployed and they actually got more money with their unemployment and their stimulus than they made every year of their life. People didn't object to that. People thought they earned it. People knew that they couldn't go to their jobs. But what happened is the scale got unbalanced. We were paying people more in the government than what they ever made. There were teenagers who were working at McDonald's and they were working eight hours a week and they were making $9 an hour when the pandemic started and 13, 14, $18 an hour now, literally in different places. But they were bringing in $22,000 in a year for stimulus and unemployment. That is like seven, eight times more of their earning power as a high school student. So people would say, how are we getting the money? How are we gonna pay it back? What wasn't obvious was those individuals, when they would need to apply for Medicaid, if they couldn't go back to work and the stimulus was over and the unemployment was over, they would no longer qualify for Medicaid. So where do you think that money went? It didn't create our money trees, even though you could buy them at Lowe's. It was a shift from where? Medicaid knew they would be saving money when the government understood that. So the money that was going for unemployment and stimulus was coming from the Medicaid dollars because according to our government, which thank goodness we have it, but they also talk about budget neutrality. And when they talk about budget neutrality, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's neutral for every component. It's neutral for the government, it's neutral for the payers, it's neutral for all of us as a community. It's shifting the money around. The other state policy that of course, it's all about behavioral health, just like the federal government and workforce development. So we're definitely in line in Ohio and other states with CMS, which is Medicare and Medicaid and any federal assistance like the American Rescue Plan funding. We already get about $2 billion from the state for next year. 
but it's unclear on how we're allowed to spend it. And what we still need to do is look at what are we going to do in 24 to 2026. We are in the most unknown time that there is, as all of you probably know, just day to day with your own lives, your own families, people still getting COVID, et cetera. This is an unprecedented time and we have to pull together. Um, there's a, the American Hospital Association um, did an analysis with Kaufman Hall. And with Kaufman Hall, it's a very large accounting and finance firm. And again, I know I'm sharing some bleak information, but I hope to bring some hope as I, as I talk about it. But you can't go forward if you don't review with the current and look at history, because history can repeat itself. And we don't want the situation to repeat itself in the next five years. Basically, um, there's the CARES Act that was put together in 2014 that increased coverage for patients, preventive, preventative um, care, your physicals, things of that nature couldn't be charged for. They had to be provided free. There's all kinds of Medicare sites that talk about that. So that whole, whole thing was about how can we help funding? Funding and covering patients. How can we give tax credit for hospitals who retain workforces, who have to retrain workforces with technology, who have to um, make sure that we have the right skill level in the right areas. So there were tax credits for that. And you can see here in this section from 20 to 21, without the CARES Act, the margins would be below the line. With the CARES Act and the funding, they were above the line. Then we moved it to 2021 and everybody's above the line because the government was there for us. They truly started to support us. They truly started to fund us. $1.9 trillion worth. So everybody, um, even with um, the, without the CARES Act, were able to move above the line with margin. Very, very carefully, very, very small, but they were able to move above the line. Um, and then in 2022, funding started to cut because no one believed the pandemic would last that long. And then with and without the CARES Act, they moved below the line. Um, right now, as of the September 22 rulings, uh, about half the hospitals moving into two thirds of the hospitals will be in the red by the end of um, 2022. Uh, other factors that are affecting the um, bottom line for hospitals is basically the hospital expenses increased by $135 billion in 2022 from over 2021. And we still have three more months of 22. $57 billion was due to workforce shortages, retention, recruitment, and contract services. The funding that we were getting couldn't keep up with it. COVID um, spent just in the, the uh, 57 billion because of COVID, $24 billion was spent on clinical labor and $29 billion was due to supplies, medications, and equipment. We literally, literally could track ships that would be stuck in the water from China trying to deliver supplies and things. So with all of that happening, it makes sense that hospitals are starting to re-gear. So we looked at where all of the, sp the spend was, and this is a chart to show you where the paradigm shift began. Um, if you look at this, 31% of hospital care and 20% physician and clinical care um, is where the majority of the spending is. And think of how many of you during the pandemic couldn't even go to a hospital. You had to do it virtually or you missed an appointment because the provider wasn't there or surgeries were canceled for patient safety. So we are being affected the most in reference to healthcare, dental, et cetera. What are we gonna do about it? We started to look at what's happening with our strategies over the last five years. Organic growth is one thing that all the hospitals are always looked at, retain the patient, right? If you start at our hospital, we wanna keep you. We wanna make sure we're taking care of you. It's all about the population health aspect of it. The, the issue is once a patient turns, becomes 65 and goes to Medicare, you can really go anywhere. There is no real out of network. So hospitals are competing and we are so fortunate in Ohio to have phenomenal hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, UH, Metro, St. Vincent's, which we'll talk about. Akron Children's, et cetera. So we have to start looking at how much organic growth is there, right? And with organic growth, there's a lot of expenses because the acuity levels of the sickness. 
So with that in mind, we have to look at in, um, inorganic growth. We have to look at, and when I say we, I'm using the royal we, I'm not representing Metro, but are there mergers and acquisitions with other hospitals, other clinics, other um, big provider groups like ambulatory surgery, orthopedics, national provider groups, drug companies, things of that nature, where we literally can invest in other types of things that will help decrease our expenses and make sure that we're providing quality to the community. And of course, that gets into the whole cost transformation. And when you look at this breakdown for stakeholders, we all think about hospitals, and that's because bottom line is 72% of the stakeholders are physicians, hospitals, and clinics. The remainder of that are the payers. How many of you sometimes really try to read what your benefits are and you have no clue? You don't have to raise your hand or you can say amen, right? I've been doing this for almost 40 years. It makes no sense. It's covered if the sun is up and it's not covered if the sun is, is, is down. You can't go after six o'clock. You can go between these hours. So they dictate and payers are our partners. So believe me, I work with them all the time. They're under a lot of stress too. You don't have to feel empathetic for them, but the bottom line is we have to collaborate and work together or we're not gonna do anything in reference to change. I really like this quote because we do have to, to um, collaborate with everyone, hospitals, schools, and churches. It's the three-legged stool. If one of those falls down, you don't have a town. Think about it. What happened when the schools all closed? Yeah. People were trying to go to work. They didn't know what to do with their children. Work hadn't sent them home yet to work remote. The churches, churches are about community, about people, about talking, about saying peace be with you next to your compadre, next to your strangers. We lost all of that with the pandemic. And so that's where we're saying hospital schools and churches. That's where the foundation is. But we have to make sure that we're aware of things and be objective and not be judgmental as things are going on. The rural, we don't live in a rural area if we live in this, this section or if we live in Cleveland. Do any of you go live in a rural area or no family? There you go. So transportation. Basically, um, because 150 rural hospitals closed between 2005 through 2019. 150 hospitals. How many of you were even aware of that for rural hospitals back then? Mm -hmm those who are affected by it, right? Rural hospitals close, what hospitals is that going to affect? It's gonna affect the hospitals that are in the cities, in the urban areas. The interesting thing is we could not find many facts about hospitals closing in the urban area. Why? Because it's just now starting to happen. We have to be very cautious with this. We've gotten rural hospitals funded between 2000 and 2019 and even in 2020. And um, but there were five in 2021 that closed and 2022. We still have approximately 30% um, risk on rural hospitals in the country. In Ohio alone, there's 70 hospitals that are considered rural. We're going to be closing at least 12 of those hospitals in the near future, seven immediate. Now they're not listed. Remember, we have big rural hospitals here. Those should not be at risk. It's the smaller ones that we're really, really concerned about. And it's bringing a lot of pressure. So even though you might only read about it in the newspaper, think about who else lives in the rural area and having not to be able to go to care down the road, which could still be 10 miles or 15 miles down the road. Do you have a rural hospital in your area, ma'am? I came to Wisconsin, so we had a that hospital okay right and I, Wisconsin was hit hard in the early times and that's that's kind of if you look at this map anywhere where it's peak our hospitals that are closing over and over again but I want to bring some hope and this is a very sensitive subject but I think it's important for everybody to understand we all as a community do not know what's taking place in each hospitals and it's very easy to judge why people are doing this or not and with Dr. Glass, our, it was interesting because we were talking about this. I, my understanding is you may be having some presentations about this in the near future. Um, but I wanted to bring a different perspective 
to it. Uh, basically, in Ohio and, and across the country, there's all kinds of ways that we're trying to manage this. It's through growth, it's through restructure, it's through repurposing, it's through consolidation, and it's through collaboration. I mentioned to you before, organic growth versus inorganic growth. Now I put these hospitals up here because these are the ones that are on everybody's mind, making everybody really interested and involved because we've had 10 hospitals closed in the last decade or so, but we've had these three major hospitals affected. So I, I wanna start with Metro. Um, Metro is easy to talk about because we were able to go through the growth and the restructure and the collaboration. So we're opening up the new Glick November 5th. We built it as a 200 bed hospital, but it can turn into a 600 bed just by moving some partitions. That's easy, right? That sounds good to everybody, correct? No, no challenges about that. We're gonna take care of our communities like we planned. Behavioral health, we opened up last week at Cleveland Heights, 112 behavioral health beds. Our hospitals are in main campus in an urban setting. We have Parma, which is a very um, blue collar area. And then we also have Cleveland Heights, was a combination of a lot of diversity. We opened it there because our EDs, and that's typically where behavioral health comes, can bring to the Cleveland Heights Hospital these patients so that we can manage behavioral health anywhere and everywhere. And then we also are investing in the community with the Via Santa, Santa complex, which is a multi-purpose complex, healthy way. That's what it means. And so people in, in 30 to 75% income rates will be able to get apartments, shopping, daycare, things of that nature. St. Vincent, they are, they're closing, they were closing, according to the papers. Mm -hmm. Then they were closing the ED and the inpatients and um, leaving the outpatient. They're doing repurposing. They still are for the community and about the community, but their inpatient and their surgeries were so low, they were carrying the expenses of the buildings and the equipment, and they were putting their entire um, hospital at risk. So they're concentrating on the outpatient, and most likely they'll look at how they can put their wings out and embrace other hospitals and embrace other services to continue with, with the community. Now we have UH, very, very controversial, but this is where I ask for empathy and for objectivity also. UH has hospitals all over, a lot of brick and mortar, a lot of brick and mortar. They had Bedford and they had Richmond. Those are very sensitive areas for what? For diversity, for inclusion, for all of those areas. They chose because of their workforce expenses that they needed to close those hospitals. Ironically, the day before Bedford closed, I was at Metro doing an employee engagement and passing out food and I blacked out and the ambulance took me over to Bedford Hospital, which was the closest hospital. I thought my life was passing before my eyes because I met people that I didn't see for 30 years who were managing that hospital coming in my room and I'm like, did I die? What's going on here? <laughs> they were wonderful. You never even knew. Many of them were moving to other locations. Many of them were looking for other positions. Um, Richmond, very similar too. We're not at those hospitals. We don't know all the reasons why they did it. So all I ask for is when you're listening about these hospitals and reading all the publications and all of that, keep an open mind. Think about if you were running a business, what you would do and how you would do it to keep things open. And, and I, I say that because I am, I very much am compassionate, but I can also see how people will target different things and say, that's terrible. Bedford I know is, is suing, uh, that's public knowledge for all these various reasons. But as a consumer, as a person, as a community, you, you need to look at all of that because you know what? Every morning it's the weather, everybody looks at the weather, what the weatherman says, it could be 50% rainy and 50% sunny. How can you ever be wrong, right? That's not how hospitals are. It's not 50% sunny and 50% rainy. There's always a, a, a different kind of a balance. Um, America simply can't be strong without its hospitals being strong. And the reality is without you being strong. And I think that's very important to recognize. Hospital management 
is done by what's called, it's a finance term, AAA. I mean, the bottom line is we started five years ago to say we have to concentrate on quality. We have to concentrate on access for everybody. And we have to concentrate on managing cost. That was in 2007. In 2014, we said, you know what? Physicians are getting burnt out. Administrative folks are getting burnt out. Our clinicians are getting burnt out and our patients are getting burnt out because people are calling off sick, can't pay, um, appointments are being canceled. So they changed it to quadruple aim. We always have fancy names for stuff, right? In 2014. So it's talking about the well being of the employees and the providers being managed. And then ironically, seven years, so seven years, seven years, seven years, I guess it's a seven year itch. We realize we need equity, more equity, more education, and really get into the community, which is called population health. That way we have a healthier community and we've improved our economy within our hospitals and even in the community. So then we did all of that. And then we said, wait a minute, the pandemic's here. So now we have your um, quadruple aim with telehealth. I guess we can't say 55 aim or 50th aim or something, but bottom line is it's about telehealth. How many of you have had telehealth visits over the last three years? Okay, so a lot of our doctors, some doctors didn't like it, patients didn't like it, patients didn't understand it, but reality is out of dime, hospitals and clinics changed to do telehealth because they could not bring in surgeries and they could not bring in patients. So it was for your safety, the employee safety, et cetera. So what we did is we took this access of convenience that we've been working with for probably eight, nine years, right? And we got out of the four walls, the bricks and mortar, and we went to schools um, and we opened up mobile clinics and we opened up more mobile clinics during the, the pandemic. Um, with partitions and things of that nature, going into the parks, vaccines for pandemic, um, so taking tests to see if you had uh, COVID-19. We moved into jails. Um, we opened up surgery centers. We opened up express cares, drug mart, CVS, Walgreens, um, Giant Eagle. How many of you thought you would go see a doctor or a nurse practitioner while you did your groceries? It's all about, right? It's all about access of convenience. Um, I wish grocery stores would have shelving that I could actually reach anything because I'm height challenged at 5'2", but they don't, but they got clinics in them, right? So it's all about how do we take care of patients? And parks is a big one now. How many white pop-up tents do you see? Sometimes have the hospital's name on it, sometimes don't. Where we're doing diabetes checking and we're getting patients more awareness and being cared for in this. All of this is brand new and telehealth is at the top of it. And with telehealth being at the top of it, we started with phones. Then we changed over from phones and we said, let's do video visits because you lost that seeing of each other, right? You were sending pictures through whatever portal that the hospitals have. Some have my chart, some have others. So we said we need to have video visits so we could connect because people are in their home not being able to connect. We ended up working with payers so that we could actually get paid for it. Medicaid in the first time in history said, you know what, whether the patient's in their home for safety and the doctor's somewhere else, even in their own home, we're gonna pay you as if they were in your hospital because we didn't lose any of those expenses. Did you think Medicare said that? No, they said, you know what, we know you have all the expenses, but we're gonna cut about 80% of what we reimburse you. So that's the kind of thing we're going for and the payers all said, we're gonna do what we wanna do and they kept changing it over the last three years. That's why I have to color my hair now because it went completely gray during the pandemic. <laughs> so we said, all right, we've pushed the pen everywhere we can. Now, what can we do? And what we realized is that specialty services can be, can be seen. You could do consults for cardiology. You can do other consults between doctor to doctor and you can manage the continuity of care. And then we really last year moved into something that everybody was surprised of. It's not home care because that's always been there. We now can have inpatients in their home. So they start in the hospital and they go back to their homes sooner than normal. And we bring the technicians, we bring the providers, we bring the nurses, we bring the equipment for monitoring. 
so that you could be in your own home and with your families and feel safe and have meals come to you if necessary. And we're supporting you in the community and the neighborhoods. And we also are doing that on an outpatient basis. That has totally revolutionized um, healthcare. And I got a call once about a bill for physical therapy. How can I pay, a, why would I pay a bill when they did it over a video? And I said, did you, did you or your kids ever rent a video or go on television in the morning and do exercise? That's very similar. They're teaching you the exercises in your treatment plan. They're monitoring on the video that you know how to do it and they're supporting you. That's more than you paying your membership to, for a video and then you do it and there's nobody even monitoring you. It can be done, but it's what your comfort level is and it's about your choices. Now I talked a lot about finances and I talked a lot about the money's being cut, 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 right? But the reality is we've survived. We might have to close some hospitals. We might have to repurpose. We may have to, to um, merge. We may acquire. But the bottom line is we are surviving and we're thriving. And I think that's important to understand. We have to continue to be innovative. We have to gain efficiencies. We talk about physician productivity utilization. We talk about employee productivity utilization, right? The bottom line is I got rid of that word for any of my team. We have to talk about efficiencies. Product, productivity, people think you're watching them, right? You're not working as hard as you should. That's not what that's about. That's about understanding how we can serve all the patients that we need to. Quality is number one. So I talk about efficiencies. We used to have financial counselors literally in 20 locations. With the pandemic, we couldn't have them in those locations. So we sent them all home and they did it via home, which they, the staff said they could never do it. Reality is we now have them in a central area, they're back to work, but we no longer have them in the clinics. Why? We literally reduced no-shows from people trying to get financial aid because now they can just do it via the telephone or via video or via their iPad. And basically, because people don't have resources doesn't mean that they don't have that kind of technology. Um, we do, we do visit notifications, et cetera. So we gained efficiencies. We didn't decrease providing financial assistance. We actually increased it by 30% more people. So that's where we have to make sure that quality and productivity um, is involved. Staffing shortages. We're reviewing benefits all over the country and what's important to the teams. Three years ago, people did not like to work remote. Now, Majority of the people want to work remote and even the hospitals are saying that's really good. We are happy. We will set you up with the equipment so that you can do that. Um, I don't work remote. I've not worked remote ever through the pandemic. And um, that's why I had to borrow a laptop because I didn't have my own to use. So um, it, there's a change. Offer overtime and incentives. Hospitals were offering five times in their salaries in overtime initially four times, three times, two times. That's not sustainable. However, it's not sustainable financially, but it's not sustainable for employees. They don't have life balance. They don't see their families. They're exhausted. That's not quality, right? So we had to look on how to, how to manage that. And that's where we started to look at exploring skill levels and interchanging in departments, working on an outpatient versus on an inpatient takes different um, types of emotions, especially if you're in a trauma area, etc. Um, so we've looked at that, looked at PR and contract services. So you only need them when you need them. And in the contracts, you tell them you have to be there when we want you there. You can't say we have to guarantee you so many um, PRN agreements because then that's not cost effective, right? The overtime is, is good because you have all the experienced people right there. They don't have the learning curves. They don't have that. But balancing is important also. And resourcing. In the olden days, the term of um, outsourcing was used, not resourcing. But this isn't really just a new label. Outsourcing was you give the work to somebody, they would do it, and they either succeeded or not, and you absolutely didn't do anything. Resources are you're expanding the services to have skilled and qualified people. 
and you collaborate and you monitor together so that your workforce is stronger. We also look at provide internal education and career ladders so that people, they may get burnt out in one role. There's a lot of nurses who, you know, I just can't do nursing anymore. Well, that makes sense. They might be the last person that a COVID patient ever saw. So what do we do? We work with them and we take their skills of nursing and where can it be adaptive? One of my departments is clinical documentation and hospital coding. I have nurses work in my department. So there's nurses who've maybe been, been at a hospital for 20 some years and they just don't wanna do that clinical anymore. So now we have the benefit of them reading charts and making sure that the quality of services are being documented in the chart. So that's a good example. Um, support your remote workforce just because a remote, does, remote doesn't mean you shouldn't see them. Get on the videos, we get on the videos with them. We come up with different kind of um, brunches and after hours and things of that nature so that they feel that they're part of the team and are part of the team. That promotes employee empowerment engagement and we invest in technology not to replace people. Technology is for transactions and human capital is for caring. And that comes first and foremost. So again, when I say, please use objectivity in what's taking place, when we hear technology, how many people think, oh, that's gonna replace X number of jobs, right? We saw that with other generations. That's not what technology is about now. Technology is about getting rid of just rote, every, like taking this to put here 100 times a day. Even for the person having to do it, it's not bringing value to them. So that's where that workforce management is happening. And we can start to reduce expenses and promote employees. And then the last one is the community patients and consumers that I talked about. The bottom line is if we don't have a partnership with you, we don't provide you with awareness, education, collaborate and guidance in understanding a mutual expectation that we've not done our job with pride. We have to make sure you have the, the knowledge to make choices that want to be made for you. Now that we have the hospitals open again, certain people may never want a virtual visit again. That can be your decision unless a pandemic or a new pandemic happens. So think about you have choice about everything and it's your personal choice. Sometimes families want to interfere with that, but we each have our personal choice and we're going to make sure for access it's available. We want to remove all the financial barriers to promote preventative and concurrent care. Patient estimates, they're on websites. People will send you information, et cetera. They're estimates. Things could change while you're with the doctor. We're human. We want things to change, right? They could be with you and you could be feeling something and the doctor can't say, well, the estimate was this and I wasn't doing this as part of your estimate. But I could tell you who gets those calls, people like me, because they say, well, that's not what I went there for. And I go, I understand that. Did the doctor let you know, though, that you were there and you needed this also? So again, be objective. Don't be judgmental. And then have the conversation about it. And if it is a surprise, hospitals will say, you know what? There could have been a better way to manage that. And if they don't, you have a right. You have a right to say, I need to look at my bill of rights and I can appeal. And it's okay to appeal. It's okay to say a concern. It is not a complaint, it is being heard. Our hospitals cannot be strong unless you're strong. And that goes for, if you require assistance, we require financial assistance. It is much different than it was 20 years ago. Medicare patients absolutely refuse to be have a financial counselor talk to them. I changed it. I have no financial counselors. I have financial eligibility specialists. Our job is to educate you. Medicare patients didn't want to accept Medicaid, even though they deserved to have it. They worked all their years, they paid into it. So I want you to, to leave all of you with something very simple. This is your life, your questions, and it's not about just asking me, it's about asking everything you read every day. And if you have an issue, call a hospital and say, why did you do that? You have a right to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Donna, thank you. That was outstanding. Thank I'm you. sorry for uh, having you had to handle so broad a topic in only 35 minutes. That's okay. But as long as I'm here, maybe you could touch on something about healthcare equity because, uh, you know, a lot of hospitals have closed. But I remember when uh, St. John's closed, they didn't exactly close, they moved to Westlake. 
and Huron's closed, and St. Vincent Charity's closed, and uh, and there's a controversy now because Bedford and Richmond Heights closed, but Hoosier's expanding. Uh, it used to be that hospitals built in uh, poorer areas of town. That's changed. Uh, do you want to make any comments on that? Um, and again, this this is my editorial, and that's why I say I was providing things that are difficult to to digest, right? Um, you know, we are in the last 50 years, and a lot of these hospitals were even older than that, right? 75 years, 100 years. Um, people all lived in the cities. Everything was there. All the tr transportation came through the rivers and the lakes. So we were all together in that. Then people started to diversify into the suburbs, move further and further away. So then we needed to make sure we were taking care of people further away in the communities. So what were we doing? We were building buildings. That was the way to do it. Build more buildings, build more buildings, build more buildings. Nobody ever realized, as I, like in the last 10 years, that people are coming from the suburbs back into the, the city, back into the places where Metro is. Houses five years ago were going for $50,000 around St. Vincent, even 25,000, around St. Vincent, around uh, Metro and around all these places. They are now 250 to half a million dollars plus in those areas. So it's interesting because the, the there's a big change in the populations also, and there's a big change in how people want to use healthcare. So I, I can't, I don't want to say that people, the hospitals are moving out because that's what you hear. They're moving out to the suburbs where there's bigger bucks, bigger reimbursement, because it's not bigger reimbursement. Everybody gets paid the same. If you're working in the inner city and you're working external to the inner city, the, there is primarily um, around the same allowables. There's some additional grant money for it when you're in the urban areas. Um, so I think out of all the hospitals that have just closed, they really did concentrate on what they needed to do. I think the difference between how some of it happened was Metro kept people aware of what was going on in the last year or so. St. Vincent, they've been closing and not closing for the last four years and having those discussions. And they're telling people, we're repurposing. We need to be outpatient because that's who's coming to us. We hardly have any surgeries here. They have Cleveland Clinic, they have Metro, they have UH. So those areas are, surgeries are going to those hospitals, especially with the elderly community. Once you're a Medicare patient, you could go anywhere. Once you're a Medicaid patient, you could go anywhere. UH had new management, new leadership in this past year. The way UH handled it was, well, there's hospitals within a 10, 10 mile radius. We needed to do this because optically they closed Richmond and Bedford, but they said they were transferring everybody to Beechwood. That's in the paper. I'm not saying anything in the paper. Well, how does that look optically? What are we all gonna say, right? And that's where I say be objective because they didn't transfer everybody to Beechwood. They ended up laying off a lot of people. They transferred to Beechwood where they had major gaps to serve the community. And in Beechwood and Mayfield Heights, there's a huge Russian community there. We all we all talk about like certain certain cultures and, and certain things and population health and social determinants. We have people all over Greater Cleveland that experience that. And that's why reading is just not all the answers. And that's why it's good to listen to people. Yes. I have a question regarding pharmacy. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. I'm a Metro patient, have been for more than 30 years. I also use two surgeons at UH. I have a drug called Gray Lease. If I order that from my UH doc, it's like it's eighteen hundred dollars for a three month supply, five ninety nine a month. If I order it from Metro, it's $30, mm -hmm. a difference of $1,770. However, the drug drifts in and out of the pharmacy list. I don't understand how that happens. 
And the second thing is, is I go to Florida for four months and Metro will not ship the drug. So I have to find somebody in Cleveland to pick it up for me and then ship it to me that way. Otherwise, I, I have no access to the drug because I'm on Express Scripts and they no longer recognize it. The second thing is, I don't celebrate the new building with Metro. I like the satellite offices, like the Dodgers is in Beachwood, the uh, nurse care sure. is over in Beachwood. It's much easier for me to find parkings for right. the building and the rest. So uh, are the satellites going to die? So two questions. No, no, no. no. So, so let, me, let me go to the first question. And I said I wouldn't test anybody, but does anybody remember me at the very beginning talking about 340B? Yes. Okay. I understand. So, so with 340B, one of the things is because Metro um, is a governmental hospital and Metro serves the lion's share of the indigent, et cetera. Everyone who goes to Metro benefits when they go to the hospital. If they're going to one of our physician clinics, like on State Road, it doesn't qualify. So our expenses for pharmaceuticals is less, and we're able to pass that on to our community. And that's what's been in jeopardy for four or five years, and we continuously try to make sure that we don't lose that and lobby it. And at a couple of our hospitals we created, and I know there's a lot of ABC acronyms, but FQHC, where that's a very indigent area, and FQHC is not being threatened about not having 340B. So the, this is where that education and awareness comes in, because um, patients need to know where do you get that 340B discount. It's really a discount to the hospital, but we pass it on. In reference, if you leave me your name and phone number, I will find out in reference to why the drug cannot be shipped. There are certain DEA regulations in reference to shipping to homes, uh, in reference to shipping to temporary residents, things of that nature, but I'm happy to follow up on it. I think it's um, to protect the integrity of the 340B program. They don't allow diversion of 340B yeah. drugs to other institutions. Well, that. That's part I, I know. of it. It's, it's a tricky little It's a life. tricky, I right. I work in a clinic yeah. with 340B yeah. family planning supplies, and then we did not because, right. again, this diversion issue. And, and there's also a thing about uh, with the pandemic, there's been shortages, but just leave me your name and number, I and yeah. I will take care okay. of that. So we have another question here, Mark. Again, thank you very much for your presentation. I learned a great deal. Thank you, Mark. Of course, you were speaking from the hospital's point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, That's too bad because I'm here on a Sunday, was in a car accident, and many other things, and I'm speaking from me. I'm not representing any hospitals, so I apologize that you're taking from that. I try to share information very objectively, so I will address anything you want. It will not well, be from a hospital it, standpoint. It wasn't a criticism, yeah. simply a statement of fact. Yeah, no. But, okay. Um, I wanted to say that... Um, the market medicine system under which all the hospitals in Cleveland and everywhere operate. Um, my sense is from the little reading that I do, um, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable under the current system, especially where hospitals are all competing against one another. And so then you look at hospitals in Richmond uh, Heights, I guess it is, and Bedford, and um, they're no longer cost effective, so they're closed. Well, uh, but what about the people who live there? Now, I don't want to get into a discussion about the hospitals themselves, why that decision was made. But I think in the end, uh, without any kind of real national coordination, and would I say the dreaded word, like uh, single payer systems in yeah. some other countries, right. yeah. this is simply, uh, this is the new normal, and it's going to be like that. You're going to be fighting as a hospital simply to keep your head above water. And you're having to make all kinds of decisions that you really would rather not have to make, but you have to, because you have your bottom line to worry about. Now I'll stop. Um, I do appreciate your uh, presentation. Yeah, I, I think, again, nothing is sustainable. Everything has to change. That's, that's the reality. We are trying to meet the needs today and figure out where to go tomorrow. That's where population health comes in. 
brick and mortar is no way going to be the wave of the future. That's why healthcare is moving into patients' homes. I mentioned outpatient, uh, inpatient, but you have to make sure that the homes are safe. Nobody is saying this is the answer for tomorrow. Brick and mortar is not the answer for tomorrow. I think what's missing is this issue of overbuilding because of competition between systems. Remember the old days of the HSAs where mm -hmm. you couldn't buy an x-ray machine unless the HSA said that your right. area of the city could use another x-ray machine. Now every office buys these $100,000 ultrasound machines and then there's not enough patients and how do you get, how do you pay for that equipment? Well, I think that's, as again, as one simple example. You have to decide, do you need it or not? One of the reasons they have it. But now there's no, you need it and Metro needs it. Well, but I think that's where the collaboration is. You go to two UH doctors, UH, Cleveland Clinic cardiologists come to Metro to see Metro patients. There is a lot of collaboration that unless you need those services, people are not even seeing. The reality is x-ray machines were because of convenience. Patients didn't want to go to a clinic and then have to go to a main hub, have the transportation expense, have the parking expense, et cetera. Everybody has a different preference. There is no right answer. And we are going to continue to grow. And Mark, to your point, there's a lot of hospitals. I mean, I can tell you there's areas and I, I think we're going to move towards that. That's a Donna comment, not a Metro or anybody else. In Kentucky, the hospitals got together and they said, you know what? You're perfect building for primary care, but for you to have to do deliveries and to do cardiac surgery and to do this makes no sense. So the hospitals got together and this was three, four, five, six years ago. They got together and they decided as a consortium, not as on paper that they merged or acquired each other, what services are gonna be provided at what hospitals? Because that way they're not, as to your point, duplicating all the equipment, all of that. You guys know the answers too. That's why I say, when there's articles and stuff, comment on them because we are going to change every day going forward. It is not going to be, nothing is going to be sustainable as it is this moment. I just want to ask one other yeah. question. This is about efficiencies. Now I am a healthcare provider. I'm a right. retired healthcare provider. So I, you know, started working in the '70s and retired right. in the 2014 as an example. So efficiencies have meant that, you know, if I, and, and this happens to me as a patient too, I used to have like 45 minutes to see a patient to do a history and physical, and I talk about exercise and diet. I see a doctor now, 15 minutes. I have on blood pressure medication, cholesterol medication. Not one person's asked about my diet or exercise habits because they don't have time. So efficiency. And that doctor should be asking those questions. So I'm oh, not going to defend something. No, no, like you don't that. have to defend it. Yeah. You don't, you can't do it in yeah. 15, 20 yeah. minutes. You know, I'm going to give an example. There's a spry senior, every senior appointment is an hour. Why? Because it's going to take an hour to have that conversation with the patient. That's what so I again, it's in action, and we have it today. We have it today. What we need to do is educate what's available for your access requirements and for your convenience. I think what happens is if you're with a doctor and that 15 minutes is not doing what you need, then you talk to the doctor and say, I really need to spend more time with you. And you talk to the hospital. And that's why we have the doctors are trying to do the best that they can. But there are doctors who are on more of a time frame. Now, Medicare, what Medicare has done is they and you may not be affected because you're in the ED, but Medicare now starting January of 23, everything is time based. Medicare wants to see how much time people are seeing their doctors. So, and Medicare has modified even reimbursement. It's all based on time. Now, I always say when people go, and I've been at the clinic, UH, Metro, and all over the country. When you go to the, when you go to see a doctor at the clinic, you're doing the Cleveland Clinic. That's what you hear. You go to UH, you have more of a, it's a blending of your seeing the doctor at the university. When you go to Metro, the reputation there is you're seeing the doctor. There's more of a relationship and not necessarily because of the doctor always, it's what the patient needs. And the millennials, they're fine to go on ZocDoc or talk to Dr. Phil, telehealth, or they don't even care about a comprehensive medical record. So everybody has 
to understand what's available to them, how we can accommodate them. It's your health. It's your health. So, you know what? I If I'm an inpatient, I'm not sure if I want to finish my inpatient at my home. I'm absolutely not sure that I would even want to do that. I may feel better or safer in a hospital, but that's where that awareness comes in and the conversations. And there's a lot, most hospitals have educational programs and things like that. I used to 30 years ago, go to fairs in Ashland, Ohio to talk about healthcare choice because people just don't know what's out there. One more question here. Uh -huh. okay. we're, we're gonna have to wrap this up. Uh, I, I apologize to Donna, it was excellent, but I probably asked you to cover too much. So we'll no, take that, that's one, okay. one more question. Yeah, I, I, Show time. I'm not one of the we that you're referring to. I have my own individual experience. I, I agree with the other speaker that we're going to have to move to a single payer system to sort this out. Personally, I'm not interested in learning insurance in order to get health care. And you don't need to. Yes, I do. At this point in time, okay. I won't know what is covered by my own policy or not unless I learn insurance. So um, how I find it is that the health care that I'm getting personally is of a lower quality than I've ever gotten before. And that I'm paying more for it. I would get better quality care by going to the acupuncturist that I've gone to previously and paying out of my pocket. Um, you want to you want more patients to come to your healthcare system, but right now the the wonderful best in the world care that that is being offered in America is actually leading to a decrease in lifespan for Americans. So, you know, yeah, it's not really a question. It's my, my and that, opinion. And my, that's fine. My experience. Um, I'm, I'm really looking for other options for healthcare. Myself. And the single payer system, a lot of us have all talked about that. You can't have competition, but employers are what manages as a big part of the management of that. It's it's you have to look at it. And acupuncture is covered by many insurance companies no, and provided no, by no. hospitals. Pardon me? Yeah, don't. yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I'm just there's there's always two sides in the middle. That's all I'm saying about objectivity. Okay, thank well, you thank so much. You, thank you again for your time. Sorry to keep you over time. Okay, that's okay. Thank you, everybody. Oh, no, 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 no,